In the animal kingdom, power dynamics are everywhere. But who is really in charge? Is it the loudest, the biggest, or the strongest? We often think of social hierarchies as being all about dominating through aggression, violence, and unequal distribution of resources. Perhaps the most famous example is the concept of alpha wolves, dominant, aggressive leaders ruling over their packs. This idea became widely accepted after Dave Meck's 1970 book, The Wolf, Ecology and Behavior of an Endangered Species. But decades later, Meck himself debunked his own theory, revealing that wolf packs are actually family units led by breeding pairs, not fierce alpha males. So if social hierarchies aren't just about physical strength and aggression, what are they really about? And are dogs more like wolves or completely different? Let's find out. For decades, we've been told that animal hierarchies are all about power and aggression. The biggest and toughest always leading the pack. It's a compelling idea, but it turns out nature is much more nuanced than that. Take the males of the savannah baboons, for example. Yes, strength guarantees power and aggression acts as a stabilizing force to reinforce rank. But that's because food sources like fruits and roots are either scattered or localized, creating fierce competition at all times. In these male-dominated societies where leadership constantly shifts, survival means being as competitive as possible. Let's look to India, where we find a completely different kind of hierarchy among elephants. These majestic animals form family units led by a matriarch, the oldest and wisest female who knows where to find water during droughts, locates safe passage, and keeps the herd socially bonded. Survival in elephant societies depends on group cohesion and collective knowledge, where aggression would only break social bonds and weaken the herd's chances of survival. And if we look at wolves in Alaska, we find yet another type of social structure, a family unit led by a breeding pair. Survival here requires cooperation for successful hunting, which is reflected in a stable and collaborative social order. Leadership is based on experience, not force. Social hierarchies guarantee survival and reproduction. But dominance and leadership doesn't always mean aggression. But how do dogs actually like to live their social lives? Are dogs just like wolves? Ethologists like Dr. Clive Wynn spent their careers pondering this very question, but they look beyond wolves to find answers. For example, in Mexico alone, there are about 60 million village dogs that have evolved alongside humans. In fact, the vast majority of the world's dogs are free roaming. So it raises a very, it, it opens a very interesting topic, right? So what is the natural habitat of the dog? And very rough estimates, very round numbers. There might be one billion dogs on the surface of planet Earth today as we speak, roughly one billion, right? Okay. How many of those dogs live the way we take for granted as pets inside people's homes? Well, probably 300 million. It's a minority. It's a minority. I mean, there are maybe 70 or 80 million in the United States, not quite so many in Europe, and then scattered through the rest of the world. So let's, you know, maybe 300 million. So maybe 30%. That means that 70% of the dogs alive today, as we speak, are not pets. Unlike wolves who hunt cooperatively, Village dogs scavenge for food scraps. Their survival relies on human settlements. There is no need for complex social coordination or even territorial aggression. Instead, village dogs are opportunistic breeders with multiple mating partners. And you won't find stable family units like wolves, but independently roaming dogs. So, are our pet dogs just village dogs with a warm bed and a meal plan? Or are they closer to family-oriented wolves? To understand how dogs decide which social hierarchy to follow, we need to take a closer look at the brain. Researchers worldwide study how the brain computes social hierarchies, and one region stands out above the rest, the prefrontal cortex. Think of it as the brain's CEO, making decisions, planning ahead, and keeping emotions in check. 
it's also responsible for navigating complex social situations to figure out how to get what you want without causing chaos. And that causing chaos means learning about your own boundaries through repeated social interactions and consistent outcomes. For wolves, this could mean learning how to follow the elderly and protect the family from intruders. For village dogs, how to tolerate other dogs and humans to get access to leftovers. The prefrontal cortex keeps track of these patterns, helping animals understand the social landscape. But how do young dogs make sense of their social experiences with us humans and maybe other dogs in the same household? To get a clue of what's going on, we need to look at animal studies. Scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies took this question further by creating a social competition paradigm to see how the prefrontal cortex handled social dynamics. A dominant and subordinate mouse were put together into a cage with a port that would signal when a food reward arrives. They found that dominant mice showed heightened activity in neurons within the prefrontal cortex when engaged in reward-seeking behavior. The mice were strategizing. Subordinate mice, on the other hand, showed increased neuroactivity in response to their competitors' actions, not the food source itself. They were monitoring the behavior of the dominant mouse. And what the data shows is that yes, even the subordinate mice would get the reward at times. Not because they fought for it, but they understood when the dominant mouse wasn't interested in the reward and went for it. So the misconception isn't just about dominance, it's about misunderstanding what social order even means. The science doesn't point to a need for humans to overpower dogs. The best way to raise a well-adjusted dog is to expose them to consistent, stable social interactions that allow for cooperation, playful competition, and clear boundaries for safety. The brain stores these patterns based on your behavior and communication. And when your dog swipes a slice of pizza off the counter, it's not a dominance move. It's not a challenge to your authority. It's the brain spotting an opportunity and seizing a chance to win. Because what's life without a little bit of fun? That's it for today. I will put the resources of this episode in the captions below. I'm Dr. Melanie and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.